two elements about molecular biology and make it actually very good for teaching. The first is that it's not really very difficult to understand if you just stop to think about it in terms of common sense. The second is that it quite frequently is almost like a murder mystery. It's a wonderful story of the way, of the way that people managed to work out how things functioned. So in this segment, I would like to discuss a little bit about how the genetic code was first identified. Once it was identified that DNA had to be the genetic material, the question came, became, how could a simple molecule that consisted of only four bases encode for uh, up to 20 amino acids? This was a challenge that was first resolved by some fairly simple mathematics that done by Francis Crick. It was really quite simple. Crick argued that one base could only code for four total amino acids. Two bases could produce 16 different combinations of each of the four bases, uh, so that it could code for 16 amino acids. Close, but no cigar. Three bases, however, could produce 64 combinations, and therefore had to be the minimum number of bases to encode for an amino acid. He then demonstrated by creating uh, mutations in which uh, one base was either removed or added, that the coding had to be in sequence. That is, one, two, three coded for one amino acid, four, five, six coded for the next, uh, and that the sequence would be read three by three by three by three. To continue the story, we need to need know one more thing, and that is that the code is ultimately held in the nucleus, but unfortunately the DNA cannot get out of the nucleus, so we need another element. The other element is that the DNA makes a copy of itself called RNA, or messenger RNA, and that leaves the nucleus and is ultimately responsible for transmitting the code to the protein synthesis machinery in the cytoplasm. Nirenberg and Matai were studying an enzyme that degraded uh, RNA. So they made an artificial RNA so that they could be able to measure it and know what was happening, which was consisted of nothing but the single base ur uh, uridine. So it was poly U. And in order to tell whether it survived, they mixed it with a protein synthesizing uh, solution to see if it could still synthesize protein. When they did that, however, they ended up getting a precipitate. What the precipitate was, uh, it turned out to be polyphenylalanine. It was insoluble because the amino acid phenylalanine is insoluble and therefore a polymer of it is. Most people would have just discarded the uh, precipitate with a few choice obscenities and gone back and tried something else, but not Nirenberg and Matai. They decided to analyze it. When they realized that they had polyphenylalanine, they realized that they had done something really very special. So what he had really done is that Nuremberg had actually spoken to a chemical and it had answered him. What he had done is he had taken his artificial substrate, poly U, and basically what he had done is he had said to the protein synthesizing chemical solution, U, 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 U. You, you, you. And the chemical solution had looked right back at him and said, oh yes, of course, I know that. Phenylalanine. 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 He had managed to communicate with the protein synthesizing machinery, and so the first codon was identified. So our dog has finally knocked out our devil, and we have our first codon. So the first codon was identified, and then began a quick and very, very colorful race uh, to find the next codons. They were identified over the next couple of years, but that again is a very different story. This and other adventures can be found in 
The Joy of Science by Richard A. Lockshin, published by Springer.